and these are in listen only mode. <laughs> I'd like to call a special meeting of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors to order. And uh, we have all the supervisors present currently, except for Supervisor Gallardo, and he'll be joining us shortly. Uh, we have one item on our agenda this afternoon, and that's the forensic audit of the Maricopa County's tabulation system and equipment, the Dominion 5.5B Democracy Suite. So I'd like to invite uh, recorder Stephen Richer to, to kick us off. Does that work okay? Oh, that does work, yeah. All right, if super, like that. Oh. <laughs> All right, if Supervisor Gallardo comes in halfway through, please act like I was saying something really smart. <laughs> He'll be impressed, I'm sure. Okay, so um, since taking office in January, my team has been doing what any reasonable, responsible acquirer of a new business would do, and that's we've been reviewing everything. So we've been reviewing the budget, as you know, we've been reviewing personnel, we've been reviewing policy, we've been reviewing inventory, and of course we've been reviewing our voter registration database, we've been reviewing our processes for recording documents, and lastly, of course, we've been reviewing our voting administration systems. And fortunately, we've had a very willing partner in the Board of Supervisors, and that's why we were here previously encouraging you guys to take another look at our voting tabulation software and hardware, and that's why I'm here today to applaud you guys for having done that and having taken yet again another look at this software. Um, so in these various reviews, we've been very clear about what matters to us and what doesn't matter to us. So what matters to us is logic, facts, and reason. What doesn't matter to us is politics. Now, it's unfortunate that my office is, of course, a politically elected position, but that's not how I think of this office. I think of this office as an administrative office, and that's the, the metric by which we judge our office. We're not going to judge our voter registration system based off of how many Republicans we registered versus how many Democrats we register, and we're not going to judge our election administration system based off of whether Republicans win or whether Democrats win. So using this rubric of facts, logic, and reason, I was pleased with the board's most recent review, audit of the tabulation equipment and software. So over the two weeks that the auditors were here in our facilities, in our elections facilities, my team and I got to spend a lot of time with them. We got to assess their methodology. We got to assess their, their ability to look at this scientifically, and we got to assess their technical capabilities. And I think that anyone who is there interacting with these auditors, be they representatives from the state legislature or otherwise, would have been impressed with these auditors. We found them to be highly professional, and we found their methodologies to be logical and thorough. For anyone who has doubts about the professionalism of the two auditors, I'd ask that you please, please read both reports produced by the auditors. And if you're only up for reading one, I'd really recommend that SLI report, and I think it would give you a good sense of what exactly was done, and I think it would put to rest a lot of the concerns that are often voiced about the tabulation equipment and software. So I'm gonna hand things over to Scott, who's going to give you the meat of the presentation and what was actually done, because again, this was driven by the Board of Supervisors, and Scott is the representative of the Board of Supervisors. But before doing that, I wanna thank two ancillary um, outfits in Maricopa County, and that's the uh, Sheriff's Office and the, uh, the County Attorney's Office. Um, Upon being elected to being recorder, I never thought I would interact with the sheriff's office, but we've already had the pleasure of interacting with the sheriff's office on multiple occasions over the last few weeks. And from Sheriff Penzone to Mr. Skinner and on down, they have been 10 out of 10 useful and helpful, and they have done gone out of their way to make sure that this process is secure and to make sure that the employees of Maricopa County are safe. I also want to thank uh, County Attorney Alistair Adele's team. 
I'd hoped that I could go at least a month or two without being sued, but I didn't even make it past the first two weeks without getting a subpoena. But Alistair Adell and her team of Tom and Emily and Joe have been absolutely fantastic in providing a lot of legal advice such that we can get through this and do it in a lawful manner. So as I've said before, I'm, I'm grateful that the board performed this audit, but I view it as simply the next step in an ongoing process to better our practices and to educate voters. Um, I know that Supervisor Gallardo and I already have plans to, to travel District 5 when post-coronavirus, and I look forward to sharing more information with voters wherever we can be over the next two, four years. And I'm grateful to have the Board of Supervisors as a teammate and an ally in this mission, and like I said, look forward to it. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Scott Jarrett. So let me move this down a little bit. <laughs> it's up higher. Oh, there we go. I'm a little bit shorter than recorder richer. So good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I appreciate your time this afternoon and the opportunity to be able to discuss and provide you an update on the forensic audits of the Maricopa County tabulation system and the Democracy Suite uh, 5.5B that you requested and approved at the January 27th board meeting. So, but before we talk about uh, and provide an update on those audit results, I do believe that it's important for us to talk through some of the items and tasks that we've already performed to test the integrity of the election and our tabulation system. And some of those tasks are, um, and many of them are required by state statute, state law. Uh, and they, that state law already provides a very robust system of guidelines and, uh, and things that we have to and must follow any time that we're performing an election. But before we even procured our tabulation equipment, we were already concerned and had and wanted to make sure that this system would work and function for Maricopa County voters. And one of the tasks that we did was in the November 2019 uh, uh, jurisdictional election, we had many different jurisdictions are have holding hosting election in November 2019, but we performed a 100% hand count of our election in that 2019 election. And that was of the Madison School District. And that very first hand count proved to us that our tabulation equipment was accurate, was reliable. Uh, we've also, during the 2020 general election cycle, we've had 10 different logic and accuracy tests. Every, we've had five elections, everything from the March presidential preference election to the May jurisdictional to the August primary to the November general election. That came with 10 logic and accuracy tests. Four of them were performed by the Secretary of State, an independent entity to the Elections Department. And all of them found that our tabulation equipment was accurate and reliable. Now I'll talk more about the logic and accuracy tests and some of the steps that were related to that when I talk about what Pro VMV did when they performed their logic and accuracy tests. But I do want to go back and revisit the hand counts. So we also performed three hand counts. Uh, and I say we, but really that's an independent party performed them. And there's been a lot of comments out there asking for an audit, an audit of the ballots. And that audit of the ballots has already occurred. And it occurs based on what's required of state statute. So in those three elections, the March presidential preference election, the August primary, the November general election, the political parties performed hand counts of those actual ballots. Independent entities, these are appointees from the political parties. Now, I do wanna go into a little bit more detail about these specific hand counts. And details are important because I've been asked, I know my counterpart, Ray Val Valenzuela, co-director of the Elections Department has been asked, well, how can you have confidence? Why are you confident in these election results? And it's because of the details. We know those details. But when we talk about a hand count, that's a conceptual term. And sometimes voters or candidates or state legislators may, legislators may not understand what is that hand count. And I want to 
go all the way back to four weeks before any election, there is a logic and accuracy test performed by the Secretary of State's office. At that point in time, we seal our precinct-based tabulators with tamper evidence seals. We then take those and scan those seals into a tracking system that produces a precinct ballot report. So when those tabulators go out to every single voting location for the general election, we use the vote center model, there was a precinct ballot report that showed exactly what seals were on every single precinct-based tabulator. We also then have bipartisan representation in every single vote center. So these are our poll workers. We have Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents working at these vote centers. Before they start election day, and that's the only day we tabulate votes in a vote center, is on election day, they do a zero report of that tabulator. So they also compare that precinct-based tabulator, those seals, they write down, they confirm that there are zero votes tabulated on each piece of our voting equipment. For this past election, we had two tabulators at every location. So they log these, they sign off. Members of different parties sign off that there were no votes on those tabulators beforehand. Then throughout the election day, voters take those ballots, they insert them into a tabulator, and that tabulator then starts to tabulate, store all those results. At the end of the day, our, our poll workers close the, re, close the polls on that tabulator. At that point in time, they log how many votes were cast. There's a receipt that gets generated of every single contest and how that tabulator calculated those results. So those poll workers take that receipt, they take all those ballots, they put them in a canvas bag, they put that receipt in the canvas bag, they seal that canvas bag with a, a tamper evidence seal. They log that seal on that precinct ballot report. Those canvas bags, along with the memory cards that we use to upload results, come back to the elections department and are immediately secured. The very next day, the parties themselves come in and they select a random sample of all those ballots and those canvas bags that will be included in the hand count. Again, this is not election department employees that are performing this, this is the political parties. Those bags are then go, we go and get those bags where they're locked in a cage and the political parties observe this process and then they're placed in our ballot tabulation center under cameras until those political parties start the hand count on the following Saturday. So this happens on the Wednesday after the election, that following Saturday, the hand count starts. The political parties there are then present when we first open up those ballots, those original ballots that were voted at a voting location. They break the seal, they take note of the seal that was logged on that precinct ballot report, and then that's when we start the hand counting of those ballots. So that it represented 7% of all the ballots that were in the general election, the ones that were voted and tabulated at the, at the precinct. The next portion is the 90, or maybe 8%. Um, next portion was 92% of the ballots that were tabulated all came, were the early ballots that came through our central count tabulation system. So when those ballots are selected, so they are processed in our early voting, by our early voting processing boards, they are, those are Republicans and Democrats and independents and libertarians members of different parties processing those, making sure separating those envelopes from the ballots. They're creating logs. So there's been rumors out there. Well, how would there be additional ballots introduced into the system? Well, they would have to go through those bipartisan boards that are separating those ballots from the envelope. They're creating logs and they're signing off on those logs how many ballots they transmit to our vote center, our tabulation center. Our tabulators, and they will not count ballots unless they have those logs. So there's no opportunity for erroneous or additional ballots to be introduced into that process. And we separate them into batches of 200. So as we're tabulating, this is all done under the, the watchful eye of the political parties, observers, not our employees. And they will select which ballots to include in the hand count audit. And they will just randomly come up to a tabulator and say, I want those ballots to be included and available for selection. When that happens, we immediately take those ballots, we put them in a box, we run the results reports, we put that in an envelope, we seal that, 
and then those are available for that Wednesday night selection to be selected by the parties. And then the same process on that Saturday when that hand count begins, that's when we open those results up and we open those ballots and then those parties do a blind count. They don't know those results. They're counting, hand counting what those results were and they compare those results. So that is the hand count process. It's very thorough and those ballots have already been audited as required by state statute. Other things that we've done is when we first procured our, our tabulation equipment, we ensured that it was going to be certified at the federal level and the state level. So that went through a very rigorous set of testing and I'll describe some of that on a future slide. We also had several different court challenges through this process. In every case, in every case of those court challenges, and this started even before the challenge period, we were successful, our attorneys, and I applaud Mr. Richard for thanking our MCAO attorneys as they went, they had a very busy uh, November and December and even going into January, defending those cases and every time we came out on top, the county, they found that there was no evidence of fraud during this election. We also had, as I've described, political parties involved, but this is an election that we had more observers throughout the entire process, right? We had observers at the voting locations as we are transmitting ballots or transferring ballots from early voting locations back to the elections department. We had the political parties following our couriers. All of those steps, there was a political party representative observing that process. They're in our signature verification rooms and in our early ballot processing rooms. So very thorough but we've also implemented significant controls ourselves over this process. Everything from having 24 seven live video feed available on our website so the public can view what's happening in our tabulation center. From using red pens, the only thing that we're allowed in our processing in our tabulation center. The red pens, the reason why we use them is our tabulators won't re read red ink. So there couldn't have been extraneous marks made on those ballot or on those ballots when they're in the tabulation center or during processing. So all of these different steps that have been taken up to, to the point of performing audits. And those audits are above and beyond anything that is required of statute. So but it's also important to talk about who is performing these audits and to take a phrase from Supervisor Chukri and it's, I've heard it many times in, in, from the board members themselves when referring to elections, but best in class. And these auditors are absolutely best in class. So they're, and when we were selecting and identifying who should be performing these audits, we wanted to have people that were not only had the skill set. Um, but the knowledge to be able to identify vulnerabilities in our system. And there are many firms out there that probably have the IT knowledge, the IT skill set, the, the credentials to audit IT equipment. But we were looking for that skill set in addition to someone who's an expert in voting systems. And these two firms combined have over 29 years of testing voting systems. They also have uh, credentials, certifications in ISO, so the international, international Organization Standards. That's anytime you're looking for quality assurance, uh, continuous improvement, efficiency, best practice, you look to ISO standards. These firms are accredited in ISO. You're also looking at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So in my former role as an auditor, we frequently use the NIST standards whenever we're auditing any sort of IT information system. They're one of the best practices and standard setting boards for auditing IT equipment. These firms have been accredited by NIST and then recommended by the US Elections Assistance Commission to perform this very work. And why is that important? It's because the elections equipment has been designated by the Department of Homeland Security as critical election infrastructure. And it's because they recognize that it is a national security concern. So if we were to hand over this, our equipment, our tabulation equipment to anyone that didn't meet these specifications or didn't have these credentials or wasn't vetted by the US Elections Assistance Commission, we could be exposing our tabulation equipment 
and that source code to vulnerabilities or potentially being released on the internet. And that wouldn't only make Maricopa County's equipment vulnerable, it can make other equipment at other jurisdictions across the country vulnerable. So that why, that's why it was important for us to only select firms that were an accredited voting system testing laboratory through the United States Elections Assistance Commission. And these two firms were, are the only ones that meet that requirement currently. Also, uh, these firms, so when they came out and did the tests, right, we had SLI compliance. They brought a team of five staff members to perform this test. And they were here for five days. And they started their days you know, at 8 a.m., worked till six or seven some of those nights, doing a very thorough, robust um, set of tests. Pro-VNV brought a, a team of two auditors. They did their tests over a period of seven days. Again, starting their days, usually between eight or nine, sometimes working to six, seven o'clock at night as well. Again, a very series of, a very a thorough tests performed by both firms. And then um, the next piece to the audit was, we understood that why this was an audit requested by the board and approved by the board and uh, desired even by the elections department to really try to identify is our election equipment trustworthy? Can we rely on it for elections moving forward? Um, we also recognize that this was an audit for the public, for the voters, for the, the candidates, for the state legislature, for the governor, for the AG's office. So we've invited those to participate in this audit as observers. We sent out invitations to all of those parties, the Secretary of State's office. These are all stakeholders who have a role in the federal election process from signing off on the certification of the state canvas to approving elect elections procedures manuals that have the force and effect of law. And I wanna thank those parties for sending representatives. Many had a representative there for many of the hours that we performed those tests. But we also just didn't open it up to those, those stakeholders. We posted this on our inner, on the website, on, on our website, through a live video stream in those cameras. And we had over 5,500 viewers view this audit as it was occurring. Um, over those, that two week period. We also had many members of the media attend as well, in person or view online. So we wanna thank all of those, those parties that were involved in observing this test. Mr. Chairman, can I, yes. can I ask a quick question? I'm sorry, I'm sure there's gonna be questions at the end, but, but I had a specific question or an observation about the observers. Um, because I know that you reached out and uh, asked people, you and Ray and, the entire group. Um, you, mentioned, you, you mentioned leadership from the Arizona Senate and House. Um, we have heard loud and clear from the legislature, particular people from the legislature, uh, that they wanted to be involved in this process. So uh, who, who, who came to take a look? Um, who took the time to come in and, and meet these people and learn about these observers uh, that were observing for, for the voters? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, spe specifically from the legislature? Yeah. So we had, uh, so um, President Fans did send a representative to, to attend. We had Speaker Bowers come in person himself attend and also had a representative for most of the days attend as well. And then we also had some representatives from uh, the minority leadership in, in the House as well. Okay, I, I was just wondering, I was extremely impressed when I, got, when I had the phone call that, that even during session, um, the Speaker of the House decided to come and, and see this. There was significant questions from, from both sides of the legislature, but to think that he took his time uh, to come and meet people that were uh, around this sensitive material, uh, I thought spoke very well of his leadership. So I just wanted to confirm that. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor uh, Hickman, you're correct. Uh, he was spent several hours um, observing the process um, d with us discussing exactly what was being tested, getting a very thorough understanding of what these audits entailed. Okay, so. thank you. So this next slide is covering what did the firms audit? And this is actually a slide that was presented to the board on January 27th. And 
this was set the scope of the work. Now, this didn't set the methodology of what the firms chose to audit. This just, we set the questions. We wanted to confirm, was our equipment susceptible to hacking? Could vote switching occurred? Was it connected to the internet? Those are the types of questions that we asked. But then we, then we then sent those questions to these certified voting system testing laboratories and asked them to determine the methodologies that they needed to take to be able to answer those questions. So they set their own testing methodologies. They are independent of Maricopa County. And this is important because as they go through and they test against EAC certification standards, there is a possibility that when we were implementing this equipment, when we were setting it up, when we were configuring it, we could have made a mistake. We could have made an error. So it's no, no better firm or firms in the country to come in and then verify whether we potentially made a mistake. Did we add a vulnerability to the process? So it was important to have these independent firms setting their own methodologies of how they perform this test. We also have one more. So the forensic audit that the board had requested is really three parts. It's the first two parts of this or two audits were from these uh, voting system testing laboratories. The last piece is a CPA firm that is, their work is underway right now. And they're doing a procurement review to make sure that when we uh, lease this equipment that we followed a state and county procurement code. So, and right now we're anticipating that, that that's been awarded to Barry Dunn. I think the range of cost is somewhere between 34,000 and 69,000, depending on exactly how many hours it's gonna take them to, to complete that work. And we anticipate that report being issued in late March. So once that's ready, I will then transmit that to the board as well, the results of that, that review. So the first piece of the audit that both SLI and ProVMB performed was source code tests. So, and this test was basically to determine whether the, the software and the equipment that we are, were using during the entire 2020 general election and what we will be using moving forward went through and matches what was certified when it went through the federal certification process and the state certification process. So this was done using what they call a SHA hash code. So a SHA hash code, and the best way to sort of describe what this is, and there were a thousand, more than a thousand of these codes. So every piece of this, this system, whether it's the adjudication stations, they have so many different hash codes based on the different programs. Um, whether it's the servers, the, the software that's installed on them or stored on them has their own set of SHA hash codes. But the best way to describe this is if you envision a Word document and it has 300 pages of text and images in that document, if there was one single change, an added space or an added period anywhere in that Word document, the, the SHA hash code would change. So when, when this goes through federal certification, they run those SHA hash code values on every single software component of the system and they determine what those values should be. And then you can test back against those to make sure that it is indeed the exact same system. So if there would have been any changes at any point to the source code or to the equipment that would show through that SHA hash code test. Now, why is it important? Why did we want to test to make sure that our equipment will still match what federal certification was? And it's important because it goes through a very rigorous set of testing when it goes through federal certification and state certification, making sure there are not vulnerabilities in the system. But I wanted to actually read what the voluntary vote, voting system guidelines, and there's two different volumes, hundreds of pages of what is entailed in this federal certification process, but two specific areas. One is related to security and one is related to to accuracy of the system. And these are the standards, the guidelines, that when it goes through certification, that any voting system testing laboratory has to audit these firms to. And so when they're looking at security, they're looking at access controls, physical security measures, software security, data integrity. But this is basically, as it's stated in 
the volume one of the voting system testing uh, per performance guidelines. The voting system performance guidelines, volume one of the VVSG, are intended to address a broad range of risks to the integrity of a voting system. Volume one identifies several types of risks that must be addressed. These include unauthorized changes to system capabilities for defining ballot forms, casting and recording votes, calculating vote totals consistent with defined ballot forms, reporting vote totals, alteration of voting system audit trails, changing or preventing the recording of a vote, introducing data for a vote not cast by a registered voter, changing calculated vote totals, preventing access to vote data, including individual votes and vote totals by unauthorized individuals, preventing access to voter identification data and data for votes cast by the voter such that an individual can determine the content of a specific vote. So these are the standards, the security standards. And a voting system testing laboratory would not certify or recommend for certification to the EAC if any of these vulnerabilities existed in that system. So it's a very robust set of, te of test standards. And it means that if the, the software that's installed on our system currently matches the software that went through federal certification, these types of things could not happen. Um, with our system. There are no back doors. So there's also a provision on the accuracy. So the accuracy requirements. Voting system accuracy addresses the accuracy of data for each of the individual ballot positions that could be selected by a voter, including the positions that are not selected. For a voting system, accuracy is defined as the ability of the system to capture, record, store, consolidate, and report the specific selections and absence of selections made by the voter for each ballot position without error. Required accuracy is defined in terms of an error rate that for testing purposes represents the maximum number of errors allowed. The voting system shall achieve a target error rate of no more than one in 10 million ballot positions with a maximum acceptable error rate in the test process of one in 500,000 ballot positions. So essentially that's saying, so a ballot position is every oval on a ballot, whether it's marked or not marked. And the threshold that they're meeting is not having more than one error in 10 million ballot positions. So there's been some statements out there made, well, how could Maricopa County a county this large, when you go through a hand count process, have a 100% accurate hand count. And it's because of this rigorous testing that the voting systems are required to go through. Not having an error in one, more than one of 10 million ballot positions. That's exactly why a hand count that found 100% accuracy can be trusted. And then the last thing I'd like to read is from the actual test results that were performed when the system went through EAC certification as it related to security. So this is the report and it says, to evaluate the integrity of the system, ProVNV developed specifically designed test cases in an attempt to defeat the access controls of security measures documented in the system TDP, that's the technical documentation package. During the security tests and the system was inspected for various controls and measures that were in place to meet the objectives of the security standards, which included protection of critical elements of the voting system, establishing and maintaining controls to minimize errors, protection from intentional manipulation, fraud and malicious mischief, identifying fraudulent or erroneous changes to the voting system and protecting the secrecy of the voting process. As a result of the security testing, it was determined that the D Suite 5.5B met the requirements of the security review. So that's why it was important for us to verify that the equipment was the same and the software that was installed was the exact same as went through federal certification standards. The next piece of the test was related. So, oh, so then we asked the auditors to perform their tests. And the conclusion was both SLI and ProVNV, so they selected a sampling of 70 total precinct-based tabulators, so 35 each. 
that represented 20% of the total tabulators that we used at the voting precinct. So again, that was 7% of the total ballot, or 8% 8, 8 of the total ballots cast in this past election. They also then selected 100% of the tabulation equipment used for early voting, our central count tabulation. So all nine of our central count tabulators. They looked at both our primary server, our backup server, our four EMS, or election management system desktops, and 40% of, uh, of the adjudication stations. So all of those went through this testing and they verified on 100% of that, that equipment that the software that was installed matched what was certified at the federal level. The next test was malicious software and hardware. So the first test proved that our equipment would tabulate votes accurately, wasn't susceptible to being hacked or vulnerable because it matched the certification equipment. There's other rumors out there that talk about, well, maybe the equipment itself is fine, but there was some extraneous device, a foreign device installed that was able to change the results of uh, uh, as they were tabulated on the equipment. So that's what this test was designed to do, to identify could there be a foreign device, either hardware or software, installed on our equipment. So they took those same devices that they used for the source code tests, the 70 precinct-based tabulators, 100% of our central count tabulators, the four EMS workstations, the two servers, and then the adjudication stations. And then they ran those through five different antivirus and malware detection systems to identify, was there any malicious software installed? And they found that there wasn't. They also took <clears throat> a, so apart those components um, piece by piece to identify, was there any malicious or foreign hardware installed? So when they had to do this test, they needed to make a clone. So we have an air gap system, a, a closed security, meaning that our system isn't connected to the internet. So when they were doing this test, we required that they use a write blocking device to make these clones. So they would take this, they would have to take out the hard drives or the solid state drives from these devices. They had to essentially take them apart completely to get access to those. So through that, when they took those apart, they were looking for any sort of foreign equipment or hardware on them. Then they would have to use this write blocking device to write over to make a bit by bit so a bit is the smallest storage uh, component in a computer. There's nothing smaller, and it's the zeros and ones um, of any programming code. So that's what they are doing when they're making a clone of the device to do their test work on. So they, when they did their work, they did it on a bit-by-bit -bit clone device. They also did it on a piece-by-piece -piece component device to ensure that there were no malicious hardware or software. Yeah, uh, Scott? I think you've already covered this, but I just want to emphasize that these auditors selected the tabulators and the stations that they wanted to audit. We didn't direct them to anywhere. They chose them randomly themselves. So, so Mr. Chairman, that's correct. So um, a few of the tests were 100% sampling. So they, like the central count tabulators, they selected 100%. That was 92% of all the ballots that were cast. For the vote centers, there were 350 tabulators used in the general election, and they randomly selected 70. So we made available all 350 tabulators, and then the auditors themselves had their choice of which machines that they would audit. We had no involvement in that sampling selection process. Okay. Thank you. So as I stated, Provian VN SLI compliance found no instances of malicious software or hardware installed on the tabulator systems. So the next myth or rumor out there is that, well, maybe this information it wasn't done on site, it wasn't done in the source code, or it wasn't done in the, uh, a malicious piece of hardware. We were transmitting these results to another location, someone's basement, another country. So then those results could then be recalculated or tabulated somewhere else and then interjecting a different result into the process. So that's why we asked the auditors to look for any evidence of internet connectivity. So we also not just 
could they access the internet right now currently, but could they access the internet for the period of, and we, we set the date and parameters of July 6, 2020 through November 20, or November 20th, 2020. And the reason we chose those dates is the first date represents the logic and accuracy test, the date before the logic and accuracy test for the August primary general election. So again, the logic and accuracy test was performed not only by us, we perform our own, but by an independent entity, the Arizona Secretary of State. They came in and performed an audit, a logic and accuracy test to make sure our tabulation equipment was accurate. And then they carried that all the way through until November 20th when we presented, Ray and myself presented the canvas to the Board of Supervisors for their approval. So we wanted to know for sure during that period of time, was there any evidence that these machines connected to the internet? So what they did for this test is, well, our precinct-based tabulators, they're just not, it's not possible for them to connect to the internet. There's no wireless network card in those devices, no ability, no ethernet cords for them to plug into. So when they went through and did that hardware test, they broke apart that equipment, bit our piece by piece, they're looking was there any extraneous device that would have allowed for internet connectivity? But they also looked and reviewed the logs and they didn't find anything. But for our central count tabulators, our adjudication stations and our EMS um, workstations, those have a Windows function on there. So that's the operating system that is on the computers. So it is possible for them to potentially have a connection to the internet. But we've configured them in a way that they can't. So there is no wireless network cards in those devices. And there is, um, and we have that air gap system, which I'll describe in a second. So when th they were reviewing all of their logs, so when they went and they made clones of these devices and all that bit by bit data, every single event log, they reviewed all of those to identify, was there any time, point in time that they connected to the internet? And because these are a Windows-based system, it's trying to get updates routinely. So several times a day, I'll try to get a time update or reach out to the internet for some reason. But in every single instance, they found that it failed. There's a corresponding failure. However, there was one anomaly that they found when they did this test. And it was actually on August 26, after the uh, August primary election and before the November general election. And we were actually taking some videos, educational videos, so we can inform the public on why our tabulation is secure. And during that, we needed to adjust the brightness of one of our tabula tabulators, the screen that we use. So just like when, if you can picture your Windows device, you know, at work or at home, there's a search bar down in the corner left. Like if you're looking for Outlook and you type in Outlook, that will then return an open outlook, but it also will return if there's any articles related to that. So when that happens, it's looking out on the internet. Now, our device, our employee looked for the term brightness and it made a request to the internet. Now, our, these audit firms found um, they didn't find that failure, just like every other time or instance when that attempted to reach out to the internet. But so then that mean they meant that they needed to do a deeper dive. So they started looking, well, we didn't see that failure. Is it possible it connected to the internet? We've already looked through all the devices, found no extraneous hardware that would have allowed it to, but it could have been possible that maybe an ethernet cord was plugged in. So they looked for every, through every single log related to that device and found no instances of any sort of log that showed that it connected to the internet. So much so that they were willing to make a conclusion, and I'll actually read directly from their report, not my words. So this was SLI compliance that when they were doing their, their log review. Basically they found no evidence of internet con connectivity was found. Such evidence would have been found if the system had been connected to the internet. So they went through and they were able to look at any log to see if a USB device, if an ethernet cord was plugged in and they could not find any evidence of that when they were doing this testing. They also did a, a review of our air gap network. They traced the wires from each of our tabulation equipment back to the server. 
to make sure that the only you know, the only cords that were plugged into the wall were the port the power cords and that any of those other wires were only going directly from a tabulator to the server no external external device no internet connectivity and this is incredibly important to us so much so that they had to change up some of their testing approach because of our security requirements, our air gap requirements. So there were, when they had to test the servers, our servers are, the data that's sitting on them is encrypted, and when it's encrypted, when it's even at rest. So if they were to take out the hard drives from those servers and try to make a clone of them, they would just get an encrypted, and they couldn't even analyze the data on that. So they had to actually use a USB thumb drive to be able to pull that data to do their analysis. But we require that they use a brand new USB device, something that's never been touched or plugged into any other device to ensure the integrity of our system. So that was the approach they took when they performed their tests of internet connectivity. And the re results from both firms Pro-VMV and SLI compliance found no evidence of internet connectivity. So we have, first we're using certified software that was went through federal certification that did not have any vulnerabilities that when it went through that certification, when it allowed for vote switching or hacking. They then went through and found that there was no malicious hardware or software installed on these devices. And then finally they went through and found whether that whether it connected to the internet and they proved that it didn't connect to the internet at all during the, all the way from July 6th through November 20th, 2020. So the last test that we asked our, and it was pro v, v to perform, was a logic and accuracy test. So the logic and accuracy test is basically to, to determine whether the equipment is accurate, so the base, whether the configuration, the design of the ballots themselves will tabulate as expected. So as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, during the 2020 cycle, we had, uh, we performed five different elections that included 10 different logic and accuracy tests. Four of those were done independently. So before every federal or statewide election, the Secretary of State's office comes in and does their own logic and accuracy tests. Those tests are done unbeknownst, so the results of those, we don't know what those results are supposed to be. They come in, they will bring their own ballots, their own test ballots, they will run those through our tabulation equipment, and then they will come compare the final results to what the initial results were to make sure that they're accurate. We also invite the parties to participate in those and to observe that process and to sign off on those results. So what we asked Pro-VMV to do was to look at the November 2020 general election ballot, run a logic and accuracy test according to their standards. And what their standards are is to, to test over 1.5 million ballot positions. So if you remember what that is, that's every single oval, whether it was completed or not completed or filled in on the ballot. And so what they did that, they ran a our test deck of 8,000 general election ballots through our central count tabulators as well as our precinct-based tabulators. And through that testing, they did have a couple anomalies. These anomalies were related to a jam, which can happen. So if you think about at, at the voting location, they, they can even happen, but a voter brings up their ballot, they insert it into the tabulator, and then there's a period of time because someone else is voting at the voting booth and brings it up. So through our testing, we had stacks of our ballots, and our, we invited the, actually the League of Women Voters and want to thank them for them coming in on very short notice in nonpartisan group to assist us with performing this, the logic and accuracy tests of our precinct-based tabulators. Well, we provided them stacks of the ballots, and they're able to then take them, insert them into the tabulation equipment, and then they do that immediately thereafter and that does present some opportunity for there to be a jam. So those two anomalies, we had to research whether the ballot was truly counted or whether it wasn't counted. In one case, it was counted. In another case, it wasn't. For that case, it wasn't. We had to back out those results, rerun those ballots through that tabulator, and then it came out accurate. 
So what ProVNV found was there was no evidence of vote switching. So, and that's what this logic and accuracy test is designed to do. When you look at 1.5 million ballot positions in a ballot, and if every single one of them is tabulating accurately, then there would be no opportunity or our possibility that vote switching could occur and that our tabulators were tabulating accurately. There's one thing that I wanna also point out on this slide. And if you see those marks that are on the side of each ballot and the top and bottom of each ballot, those are the timing marks that are specific to each ballot. Those timing marks don't exist on any other ballot in the country because they're unique to Maricopa County's ballot. And the only way to design a ballot that would be read for a specific election is to be inside our ballot tabulation center with access to our passwords, logged into that account, designing that, those specific ballots. We have over a thousand different ballots in Maricopa County. If someone were to design another ballot in another jurisdiction using a different software program and then try to insert that ballot into our precinct-based tabulator or our central count tabulators, our tabulators wouldn't read it. So you have to have designed that ballot in our tabulation center with access to our, our computers. We have access restrictions on who can access their under 24 seven live camera feeds. And our staff are working, especially during an election, almost nearly around the clock. So there's really no opportunity for someone to create extraneous ballots or additional ballots um, and then have those inserted into the process. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions that the board may have related to <coughs> forensic audit. Yes, uh, Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Scott, thank you for a very thorough explanation of these two audits. Again, I hope that the people are having the opportunity to watch this and see that this, this was a, these were real audits uh, and provided real answers despite what some may be suggesting out there. But, you know, a question that I had about this hacking issue, um, you know, really focusing on that. Um, my question to you is if someone were able to get in there and hack, I mean, if they're good enough to do that, then what is stopping them from going in and, you know, covering up all the tracks that they were there? Can can you speak to that? Because it seems to me if you're good enough to get in there, you probably cover the tracks up. What's your, what's your uh, response to that? So, well, this audit, one, would have found if that happened. So, right, there's a record created of every single transaction that's performed on this through the logs as well as when they made those bit-by-bit -bit clones, right? So when they go back and make those clones and they analyze so much so that they could see for example, the brightness test, that one brightness word, or when they went and they, when we were actually compiling data for the Senate subpoenas. So when we did that, we had to generate these logs that were requested over you know, 10 gigabytes of data that we ended up sending over to the, to the Senate. Um, they were able to see when we ran those, the specific date and time that we ran those reports, where we plugged in a USB drive, to save those, where we had to save them in one instance to the desktop, where we we're compiling several different reports. When we then copied those, uh, those files from the desktop to the USB drive and then deleted those specific logs, those copies of those logs. So every time there is a transaction, there's, there's a evidence of that created. And so that's where those audit firms you know, doing a forensic audit would have been able to see if anybody had made any sort of access or then tried to cover up that access. Other questions, comments from the board? Supervisor Chukri? I was gonna to defer to my colleague, Mr. Gallardo, first. I was gonna to defer to the kids' table first. <laughs> This is the first time I'm not there, Clint. I gotta say, even at the kids' table, I'm still taller than you. <laughs> That's true. It doesn't take much. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, no, uh, if it's okay, I'd love to just chime in real quickly. Um, 
first of all, congratulations and thank you to uh, everyone that participated uh, uh, in this uh, audit. I know it, it's uh, not only just the the uh, the two firms that participated. I know there was a quite a few observers and so on. I even gotten calls, by the way, back to uh, Mr. Hickman's question about the observers that were there. I did get a call from um, a couple of the Democratic senators that had inquired about the observers and, and so on, and I did rest assured that my, my office, I did have David uh, in my office, was present, sitting in the, he was sitting in the back kind of watching as well. So um, just on my side of the aisle, mm -hmm. just to let them know that, yeah, we are, there was going to be definitely a presence, so just for the, for, for, for the record. But, um, Scott, one, one of the things that, that I hear a lot from those that have really been casting stones at our democracy um, is the, is the, uh, the, the audit of the ballots, and I'm not too sure exactly what they mean by that, but why, why wouldn't we audit the ballots? I'm assuming that's a review of the ballots when they say that. So, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Garrido, well, those ballots are currently sealed and under seal, and by state statute, I don't have the authority, the board doesn't have the authority to be able to unseal those. They can only be unsealed by a court order and for two specific reasons. The first is a automatic recount and those thresholds are set clearly in what statute. So if a contest falls within those recount figures, then, then there can be through a court order a recount completed and those ballots would have access or through a challenge. And that's also defining in statute. That's five days after the Secretary of State, um, the Secretary of State canvasses the elections. There's a challenge period. And actually, there was a, another audit, and I omitted this from the first slide, because a court did order a review of our duplicated ballots, those ballots that were manually duplicated. We had 27,000 of those in this past election. And um, those ballots, and we're actually implementing procedures to even try to drive down those, those numbers for future elections. In prior elections, we had over 100,000 ballots that we had to duplicate. We're hoping to get that less than 10,000 through continuous improvement. But so they asked us to look at first 100 ballots. And through that process, we did identify that there were, you know, a couple. So our duplication boards made a couple errors through that duplication process. The court then said, well, let's look at additional ballots. We went and looked at over 3,000 additional ballots, and they found a handful more errors. What they found is the duplication process was 99.4% accurate and wouldn't have resulted in a different outcome on those ballots. So there was an additional review and audit of the ballots. But the reason we can't is because they're sealed according to state statute. So, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman Scott. So one of the terms I hear, and I, I kind of follow folks on, on, on Twitter, and I hear comments from, from not only legislators, but, but folks outside, um, uh, they keep using this term, a deep dive. Well, you know, the, what, what Maricopa County um, is in, having these two firms do, they're not doing a thorough audit. They're just scraping the surface. They're not truly looking at um, the system as a whole. Uh, what would you say to those that say it's not a deep dive? Yeah, I think it is. I, I mean, I hear what has been performed by both firms. Um, I would definitely say that is definitely a deep dive. What would you say to those that say, well, you're only scratching the surface? Well, the first piece is you look at the credentials of the firms themselves. and. They are experts in this area. So when you ask the experts and you ask them specific questions, you rely on their skill set, their capability, their knowledge to be able to identify exactly how they're going to go about their test work. So if you bring in a best-in-class organization to perform this work, they are going to make sure that they do a very thorough and rigorous test to be able to draw a conclusion. But when they did their work, I was there, I observed it, the chairman was there observing parts of this. It was, they took apart our equipment piece by piece to be able to determine whether there was any malicious software that was installed on that. That is a deep dive. That is a forensic audit, taking apart that equipment. When they did a, the software test, 
right? They made a bit by bit clone of the information and put it on another hard drive. We had four different, uh, so SLI performed four different tests using uh, the different antivirus and malware tests when they performed their work. Then we had ProVNV come in and use an entirely different malware test and antivirus system to do their work. They tested it in a dynamic state. So they took that data, they copied it using a right blocker device to another hard drive. They brought their own equipment from their lab in, in uh, from uh, Alabama and then installed that new cloned hard drive onto that equipment to put it in a dynamic state so then they can run their analysis on it. It was incredibly thorough, down to the bit or down to the piece, and they compared all of that back to what was the design build, that design build that went and was certified at the U.S. Elections Assistance Commission. And, and to be all honest, Mr. Chairman, Scott, um, I don't think they know what exactly a deep dive is. It's a talking point by many of these lawmakers. It is something they spell out. They're trying to spin this to a small group of folks that continue to want to make ruckus and not get over the fact that the election was safe, secure, and it was accurate. They're not happy that their candidate lost. I get it. No one's happy when they lose. It's just the nature of politics. But the fact is, they have no idea what a deep deep dive is and what what was described right now and what, what was performed by these two firms is definitely a deep dive. And I wanted to real quickly ask Ray if, if Ray would be real kind because him and I started around the same time there in elections. And Mr. Chairman, uh, I started my adult career as an employee in 1988, in 1988, uh, in the elections department. And uh, you, may have, you may have came like a year or two after I did. But nonetheless, out of all the elections that I have seen, I have never seen such a forensic review of an election than ever before, since 1988 that I, was, that I had been there. Um, what would be your, I guess, your assessment on what we have done this year? And Mr. Chairman, this is one thing that I, I, I've been holding my tongue on, because we say this a lot that we should be following what, is, what the statutes and what legislatures have direct us to do. We, follow, we don't go above and beyond. I hear this, unfortunately, on certain things where I think we should, but nonetheless, the board decides this is what we're going to do. Let it be elections or let it be another area of county business. We have gone way above and beyond outside of what, of what is required in a normal election. How would you compare what we have done now in any other election? Chairman, Supervisor Gallardo, and I concur that we're old. <laughs> uh, we <laughs> age gracefully. Yes, but uh, uh, in my three decades of being in elections with, specifically, Maricopa County, this is the most extensive audit that we have done ever. And even I can go back to saying that I know that because past that would be punch cards and there wouldn't have been some kind of this technology. So we definitely, this was a absolute deep dive to the point is that, it, again, it's never been done. And even in other nations, when you look at some of these other forensic audits, this is the first time a forensic audit on boat system tabulation equipment has even been asked for in this nation. So this is not something that, why we went to those vessels, those boats testing laboratories, because it's something new. So when you went back there and said, you want brain surgeons on this new procedure? Yes, we do. We want both system test laboratories on this, but it is the most extensive. And I do want to, when you ask about the ballots, because it kind of sounds like, well, why can't we look at the ballots? The fact of the matter is, uh, Code Director Jared already mentions, we did. We actually did a hand count. We did over 47,000 different vote positions that the, actually, I'm sorry, the political parties, participants did. We didn't those groups that were appointed. So we did look at the ballots. So when you say, well, why to complete this full circle or the loop, you should look at the ballots, then we do have that hand cam report that is posted that does show that if this equipment's been validated, good in means good out. So that we verify the equipment is tabulated correctly and we've done the preemptively the hand count that says these are the ballots that were counted and then they are accurate, 100%. Well, and I, and I like to remind people that I talk to and I'll bring it up here again, that we did a 2% hand count of the mail ballots, which was required by the legislature. And, you know, I've had people asking me, well, it says 2 to 5%. Why didn't you do 5%? 
because all of the political parties that we talked to ahead of the election were happy with 2%. And in fact, we were told that was a statistically significant sample size to prove the validity of the, of the tabulating equipment. No one was unhappy about doing 2% until they didn't like the results. Chairman, if I, if I may add. And, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just finish by saying, and just because you don't like the way the results turn out doesn't mean you can change the rules after the fact. And if I may just add to concur on uh, the fact that there is a vote verification committee established by the statute made up of two statisticians, one from U of A, one from ASU, and I always tout the fact that there's anybody that aren't going to agree that they, maybe those are the, the ones that would not, and they too have come back and they established the variance, but they also have looked at that 2% to say from a statistician's perspective, is that a significant sample to show variation? And they'll say, you probably only need to look at 10 ballots to see if there's any vote flipping, because you would see that immediately. But if statistically, that 2% has always been proven through that vote verification committee. And Mr. Chairman, just on, on that point, I was there in the legislature when they had this debate, and it was members on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, that said, why don't we just do 2%? It was a legislative directive. They decided 2%. It wasn't the elections department. It wasn't the political parties. It was the legislature that said 2%. So just to, to note that. But I, I do want to just close with this, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know that as soon as this is over, uh, we're going to have folks that are going to continue to to doubt the, the, the forensic audit that was done. They're going to continue to to cast stones, they're going to continue to try to undermine our democracy. Uh, they're never going to be happy. And I think I've said this last time, um, I frankly don't care what they think. I really don't. If it is a small group of folks that are not happy with the election, and there is not no audit, nothing that this board or this elections department could have done to make them be satisfied, they're always going to doubt it. It's just how they are. And that's the unfortunate part. But nonetheless, I believe the vast majority, Republicans, Democrats, independents, they believe in the system we have. We, our system has credibility. It continues to be proven time and time again through not only a hand count, through, through LNA tests, more LNA tests than I personally think was necessary. But nonetheless, they were conducted. Uh, the two forensic audits that, in my mind, and continue to be, the deep dive. If you ask some of the folks out there that continue, particularly two legislators, one in the House, one in the Senate, I hear it all the time, oh, we need to do a deep dive. They have no idea what the hell a deep dive is. They don't. And it's so frustrating because I sit there and I listen to it. But nonetheless, I think they've done an incredible job this year pulling off uh, uh, three successful elections in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, they should be awarded and, and applaud every time they, they, they stand in front of us, and we do. We recognize it, and I think the vast majority of the voters recognize the performance that they have done in the middle of a pandemic. Um, the one thing I do want to ask real quickly, because I hear this all the time too, and that is the auditors, the two auditors that we've selected are not certified. Can you comment, are they certified on that? Let's put that to rest. So Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gallardo, so the firms that we selected to come in are voting system testing laboratories. The, as I described in my presentation, they are best in class and they are certified, they're certified from the U.S. Elections Assistance Commission to test and audit voting systems. And that includes uh, going into this deep dive that we just did. There's no one better to ask for them to come in and do a thorough review. We wanted someone that not only had that skill set, or the, the knowledge um, from being certified, being a, having a technical background, but also had the skill set and the knowledge of voting systems themselves. And we wanted them to be able to identify if there was a vulnerability. And there's no one better to do that than these two firms that we asked to come in. And they are certified by the U.S. Elections Assistance Commission. Now, there are, so, so right now on the, the U.S. Elections Assistance website, they have certificates, and those certificates have dates on them. Well, 
So the U.S. Elections uh, uh, Assistance Commission, they have appointees. They're, the commissioners are appointed by, uh, I think there's two that were appointed during uh, President Obama's term, two that were appointed by, uh, during uh, President Trump's term. So they didn't convene to, so Pro V and V, they have a, a certificate that I think is dated or shows expired in 2017. They went through and had all their necessary audits and they were recommended for continue certification. Well, in order for their certification to lapse, they would have needed the commission to vote and say they're no longer certified. And that's set in the US Elections Commission standards. So they are a certified firm and SLI compliance, the reason the US Elections Commission didn't convene and that they didn't get their audit done last year was because of COVID-19. But there's two memos on the US Elections Commission's website that say that both firms are in good standings. And there's one other thing that I wanted to point out. And you're, you're right, Supervisor Gardo, that some may question whether this forensic audit was a deep dive and whether it should be um, people can rely on the results. I think I heard on the radio this morning coming in, well, maybe there needs to be an audit of the audit. And that actually currently exists. That already happened. These voting system testing laboratories, they get audited. They get audited by NIST. They get audited by the U.S. Elections Assistance Commission every other year. So that audit has already been completed as well. So we've had not only these two forensic audits, two different firms, those auditors, the, the certified voting system testing laboratories are audited themselves. Supervisor Chukri, you've been very patient. No. Uh, just a, a few things. I want to. I do want to. Without uh, joking aside, with Mr. Gardo, piggyback on a question he had because I think it's it's warranted. There was so we're talking about myths. We're talking about uh, people. Uh, being entitled to their own opinions. I think it was JFK that said you could have your own opinions, but not your own set of facts. And that's abundantly clear here. That's what uh, our new recorder, Richer, has been doing uh, since taking office. <clears throat> and the question is this, uh, Scott, it, there was this, this notion that the auditors selected actually hired Dominion employees. I have a guess as to what that answer is, but I'd like to hear it from you. So, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor <laughs> Gardo, so both firms have stated on the record and attested that they have not hired Dominion employees. And actually, through the U.S. Elections Assistance Commission, they've thought of this. So they set standards for these voting system testing laboratories, and they are not allowed to hire former employees from any vote tabulation systems such as Dominion. Or if they do, then they have to set safety protocols in place. And then those staff members are not allowed to then do any work related to the system that they designed. So there are standards in place for if they were to hire. But both of these firms have attested that there are no Dominion employees on their staff. Perfect. Uh, I think if we if we take a few steps back and we look look at the evolution of elections, uh, people who no longer sit uh, on this dais recognized years ago that the Maricopa County construct of way back when, maybe the 1950s or so, uh, wasn't when we were had a population of 300,000, uh, is not really the the ideal situation nor the responsible construct for Maricopa County of today with well over 4 million people. And I concur with that. And, and we worked with Mr. Valenzuela, the prior recorder. You, you were created out of this, uh, position-wise, not by birth, uh, but uh, yeah, maybe both, actually. Uh, but but um, so, so I want the public to make sure they understand that, because if we were trying to pull off an election that was not just, that was not 100% above board. Why would we have done these things over the past three to four years? We wouldn't have, plain and simple. Uh, and so transparency is something that I campaigned on back in 2012. I think that's what we're accomplishing with these audits. And, and to Mr. Gardo's and other comments that people will cast aspersions and stones, so be it, they can. But 
let's go back to that fundamental premise of having your own opinion, it's not your own set of facts. So Scott, along those same lines, um, you talked about the canvas bag and the security thereof and what was going into that. And it's my understanding that we have sheriff deputies following those bags back to here. You didn't say that, but it's my understanding that that's the case, correct? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Chukri, that is correct. So when they're coming back from those vote centers, we have members of both parties accompany those bags to a receiving site. And we set up, and the reason we set up those receiving sites is we don't want our poll workers, especially in the outlying areas, after a very long day of working the polls, to have to drive those, those results all the way back downtown to the Maricopa County Elections and Tabulation Center. So we set up these receiving sites. We have sheriff's deputies, as well as two members of each party, plus our truck drivers, at each of these receiving sites. And they're going through a, a thorough checklist and accounting of making sure that every piece of um, equipment that's supposed to come back, the paperwork that's supposed to come back, the ballots that are coming back are returned. They're returned with the appropriate seals and security measures. And then when those, those trucks come back from that receiving site, there was one MCSO sheriff's deputy that was there at the receiving site. And then we had a second a company. So there was two patrol cars that accompanied these trucks all the way back to the Maricopa County Tabulation Center. And then once they received, they, they were here, we had political parties observing the return process and we're in our tabulation center that whole entire night as we are uploading results. Great. Scott, are you aware the manufacturer or the equipment we had uh, prior to this Dominion equipment, we had, and Ray, you can nod, I think for 20 years or so, uh, a substantial amount of time. Do you know who the manufacturer of that equipment is or was? Depold. So Dominion, actually, I think it was Sequoia. There was several changing of hands because sometimes uh, tabulation uh, equipment is purchased by another company. But since uh, I think it was somewhere around 2010, Dominion was the supporting uh, tabulation equipment manufacturer that supported that equipment. So since 2010, all the way up until 2020, it's been Dominion supporting the Maricopa County Elections Department and providing the tabulation equipment. So the old adage about duct tape on equipment was very apropos for our former equipment. And we can recall that uh, those election results took weeks, uh, embarrassingly so. Uh, to come up. I had colleagues in other states saying what's taking so long, primarily with the 2018 election. So there's a nexus between the equipment that was formerly used that was very draconian for Maricopa County of, of 2020 and really 2018, 2016, we can argue with our population. And yet that equipment was supported by Dominion, which is being called into question today. Yet in 2018, 2016, 2020, uh, 2014, every two years, we didn't have the kind of conjecture or concerns. I think that's important to note, Mr. Chairman, for the record. How many producers of tabulation equipment in the United States are there? Do we know that? Five. Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Chukri, there's currently five uh, producers of tabulation equipment. Okay. Mr. Chairman, in closing, I would just say, and. and Scott, I would have one, one last question for you, and that is that um, it's about progress, not perfection. And lessons learned, we do know, uh, I think volunteers, there were two memory cards at one point that were left behind. I, I mean, I think there's been some lessons learned. I think that we quickly did that. But one thing that uh, ha I think the viewing public and our residents and voters of Maricopa County have to understand is we rely on volunteers during these elections. Their fellow citizens, their neighbors, their cousins, their family members, their brothers, sisters, all of that. Um, and as long as we do that, because we have to, uh, we're gonna continue to be working toward being best in class to continue to, to do that. So in the business world, right, if, if you're not selling more or achieving better than 3% every year, you're failing because the inflation rate is 3%. So as we move forward, I don't wanna have an abundance of, of overconfidence that because we were so thorough with these audits and this equipment this year, that all of a sudden in 2022, we don't have a care in the world. So I'm not asking you this, Scott or Ray and Mr. Richard and others, I would just say as we move forward, 
uh, let's make sure we understand the lessons learned. Let's make sure that we understand that this isn't the far right or the far left that has concerns about what occurred. Uh, some average Arizonans do too that are still just a part of the political process only by voting, not because of being an activist. Now, I think that's low to Mr. Garo's point. I think a lot of people were dissatisfied with the outcome, which is a different situation. But, but the important thing to, to walk away with is that we listened. We listened to our residents. Uh, we had these audits. Um, we're gonna work with the state Senate um, the best we can, and most importantly, I think, through the legal system to answer the last outstanding question, Mr. Chairman, and that is uh, how these ballots can be accessed or if they can be accessed. Uh, and the court's gonna determine that. It's not gonna be us, it's not gonna be subpoenas, it's not gonna be getting arrested, it's gonna be that. So I thank all of you, uh, including you, Mr. Richer, for, uh, as we say, jump in, the water's freezing. Um, but for you to come in in the way you have and really just jumped uh, just head first into it, Ray, you and your team, and of course, Mr. Jarrett, uh, you've never said no. Uh, you've never tried to shove off this board with the questions we've asked uh, or the inquiries we've had, especially with this audit. You said, bring it on, let's do it. Let's make sure we put this to bed. So I thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, as I've told Stephen before, welcome to Thunderdome because that's what you've uh, acquired uh, with this job. I, you know, over this, over this last year, uh, I'll refer again in my chairman's address, I talked about elections as my preeminent um, uh, action I was going to try to do. This county needed to run uh, uh, three elections in a one-year time period. And in my chairman's address, not once did I say uh, in last January, not once did I say pandemic or COVID-19. And our group, our county, has um, acted wonderfully in this, our public health, but not least of which is our entire elections department, where the world was evolving by the hour. Uh, you guys did a great job. And I will tell, Mr. Chukri said about those cards. You know, I, I brought it up to you before, Scott. We, we, used, we used these elections, the primary, the, I'm sorry, the presidential primary uh, or preference election, the primary and the general, and we learned things. And the, can you imagine if we would have left those six digital cards behind for this general? Uh, but we learned something on that primary and we put in new processes to make that not happen again the best of our ability. This is all about people. Thank you for bringing that up, Steve. So many people, I worry about this and what's in the air that how are we going to get volunteers to work these elections again? How are we going to find sites uh, with elections again? It is gonna be next year's problem, Stephen and Scott and this board about enticing people back to make sure that they believe in the election and they, they will believe that Maricopa County runs great solid elections. And that was even said by the, the governor uh, of Arizona to the president, uh, the then President Trump. And he said that uh, prior uh, to the election and it went south directly after the election. So um, not by our doing, not by our doing. So. Um, I will, because I live this as chairman, um, and I did have discussions with uh, House and Senate leadership all the way up till uh, the point where they subpoenaed us. And I do remember the definition that you talked about, uh, Supervisor Gallardo. What is a forensic audit? Because that's what we start, I started to ask that before I appeared in front of the Judiciary Committee. So I asked it back. I'm, I don't know. What's a forensic audit to you? There was a lot of them, a lot of people that said, I don't know. I think it would look at this or that or however, but that has evolved. That, that conversation has evolved even to this point about what a forensic audit even is. But I know that when I was talking to them about a forensic audit, to me as a businessman, I was talking about machinery, sure, processes, sure, software, sure. 
But I don't believe in that time frame when I was talking to them that the word ballot even came up. I don't think they said one thing about a ballot. For them, I think it was, at that point it was a piece of paper, but now it's changed and now ballots are a key part of a forensic audit. And we are going to let a court decide because clearly in black letter law, it said we have no option to look at those ballots. They are sealed. And if a court wants to look at, look at them, it's by court order. So we, will, we had an unnecessary fight with the Senate and the Senate leadership uh, for something that clearly spoke to me in black letter law that we were not supposed to look at those. But if a judge wants them, if a judge sees evidence uh, that they wanna take a look at it, if the Senate wants to bring evidence to look at those ballots, but we all believe in the sanctity and the privacy of the ballot that we each voted. So we will start finding that out tomorrow morning at, at 9 a.m. and I wish, I wish our legal team well. Again, a thousand times over, I say that I am passionate about elections. I'm not defensive. This board has had nothing to hide about this. All we wanted to do always is say just what a wonderful job our people did through a pandemic and it still remains true. So I did have a quick question because we were talking about the machinery. Uh, I have heard some people in the legislature have said that we wiped the machines in order to get ready for an election that is going in our district, Goodyear, Arizona. I've heard rumors that there are legislators that said, I don't care about Goodyear. Well, I certainly do. They are in my district. They are a big part of my district. And we are in the middle of an election that will determine, determine the future of how Goodyear is represented, either districts or at large positions. That's important. That's important to a mayor. That's important to those council members. And that's important to the city which I lived in for up till three years ago. So let me ask you, now, how can you ensure the data from the November 2020 general election was not changed or altered during the audits and while preparing for the Goodyear elections? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor um, Hickman, the reason we can confirm that and guarantee that is because, so we have our precinct-based tabulators, those memory cards that came back to us, those, all the data, from those memory cards is currently sealed in the vault. So everything related to the November 2020 general election from the precinct-based tabulators is in the sealed vault and available if a court ordered that it to be reviewed. We also have all of our central count tabulators backed up on our servers. So there is a copy of all the data from the no November 2020 general election available and secure. For the Goodyear election, we're able to create different file structures. So when those, that new data that is being going to be accumulating, those new logs, those new reports, for when we start tabulating, which we already have, we started tabulating this week after logic and accuracy test for the Goodyear election, that's being stored in a different file structure. It's not overriding or, and deleting any of the data that's available and still there from the November 2020 general election. And we can confirm that through the work that these audit firms just performed. They could see every single log that we, that was created, every single file, every single um, time that we access the equipment. So much so, so when we did the November 2020 general election, we had to do a statutorily required post LNA. Well, in order to create room for that, we had to actually move some of those results over to the backup server. So from the November 2020 general election. So we had room to be able to run that post logic and accuracy, accuracy test. Well, those firms, those audit firms, when they came and did their forensic audit, they could see all of those transactions. So they're all still there. They're all still available. Nothing's been overwritten. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, would like to say again, thanks, Scott. And there, what has been represented to me out in the public is there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people requesting uh, 
a forensic audit and how we were going to do this. Um, I think I sent messages to 35 people last night saying, hey, we're going to announce the results. We're going to be able to ask your questions, uh, your questions of, of our team about this audit. And, um, you know, I just talked to, just sent a little text to my chief of staff out there and said, how many people are watching right now? Because this room has seen a lot of information between the canvas, all of the pre and post election uh, things over the last year. Uh, he said 70 people are watching right now. So, but what's important is all five of us, I think this is the first time all five of us have been in the same room together uh, since the canvas because of the pandemic. So what we are hearing for is, are the voters and the citizens of our individual districts that we can ask these questions so we can go out with full knowledge and tell everyone again, just about what this audit did for our community. I wanna thank um, uh, Chairman Sellers. Uh, in December when I was chairman, uh, I flew out an audit team to prepare so we could do an audit that would m more match up the timetable of expectations of the, some of the people that were asking questions, but we couldn't pull it off because it was still ongoing litigation. So we, could, we couldn't do it. And what you did is decided to fly out that same team. And what you did is also bring in another team. So the audit of the audit has been done to me, with, for me for my sake, there were two individual highly qualified teams that this county and this county taxpayer paid for. And it is, I don't care what people say, it is money well spent uh, to do that because that's what we have been hearing. How do you know that that guy said that guy would did the right thing? We performed that over the last two weeks. So thank you, uh, Chairman Sellers, for having that vision to pull that off for our board. I appreciate it very much. And Supervisor Gallardo, thank you very much. Uh, we look to your vision and wisdom because you have spent a lot of time as a young man uh, and growing up in this county, and that was one of your first jobs, and you, and you did it well, but we've looked for your guidance, and you could have easily taken the political tact of saying, I don't care, I'm not for seeing an audit, my guy won, and I don't want to see anything, but you've never said that. So thank you. That's, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank how, you, Supervisor. How young is young? Did, what was that reference? Because <laughs> <laughs> you were smiling over there. I, 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 I haven't aged at all. <laughs> and anything else from the board? Okay, I, I just want to make a couple of closing remarks. Uh, you know, first of all, I want to thank the elections uh, department team uh, they, they have really worked overtime through this whole process. And I, I think that it's important for people to realize that, that through everything that went on from the pandemic that, that impacted what we were doing, that completely affected the way we could even hold an election, uh, down to, to doing vote centers so that we could deal with the reduced number of, of people that we had for poll, poll workers and those kind of things. Just an amazing job on your part. And, and also, you know, this board has had a lot of really tough questions as we went through this because we really have been concerned about ensuring that we had an honest, secure, efficient election. And none of you ever backed down from answering those questions publicly. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy now that we have uh, Recorder Richer as part of our team. He, 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 he came in with the same idea about this whole process that I have had through the whole thing, and that is that when you accept responsibility for an election, you have to forget about party politics and individuals, you're representing the entire voting public. And that is so important. And our recorder gets it, and so do we. So thank you all. That concludes our meeting.